السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله السلام عليك يا ابن رسول الله السلام عليك يا ابن أمير المؤمنين وابن سيد الوصيين السلام عليك يا ابن فاطمة سيدة نساء العالمين السلام عليك يا ثار الله وابن ثاره والوتر الموتوك السلام عليك وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليكم مني جميعا سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار يا أبا عبد الله لقد عظمت الرزية وجلت وعظمت المصيبة بك علينا وعلى جميع أهل الإسلام وجلت وعظمت مصيبتك في السماوات على جميع أهل السماوات فلعن الله أمة أسست أساس الظلم والجور عليكم أهل البيت ولعن الله أمة دفعتكم عن مقامكم وأزالتكم عن مراتبكم التي رتبكم الله فيها ولعن الله أمة غتلتكم ولعن الله الممهدين لهم بالتمكين من قتالكم فرئت إلى الله وإليكم منهم وأشياعهم وأتباعهم وأغليائهم يا أبا عبد الله إني سلم لمن سالمكم وحرب لمن حاربكم إلى يوم القيامة ولعن الله آل زياد وآل مروان ولعن الله بني أمية خاطبة ولعن الله ابن مرجانة ولعن الله عمر بن سعد ولعن الله شبرا ولعن الله أمة أسرجت وألجمت وتنقبت لقتالك بأبي أنت وأمي لقد عظم مصابي بك فأسأل الله الذي أكرم مقامك وأكرمني أن يرزقني طلب ثارك مع إمام منصور من أهل بيت محمد صلى الله عليه وآله اللهم اجعلني عندك وجيها بالحسين عليه السلام في الدنيا والآخرة يا أبا عبد الله إني أتقرب إلى الله وإلى رسوله وإلى أمير المؤمنين وإلى فاطمة وإلى الحسن وإليك بمبالاتك وبالبراءة ممن أسس أساس ذلك وبنى عليه بنيانا وجرى في ظلمه وجوره عليكم وعلى أشياعكم برئت إلى الله وإليكم منهم وأتغرب إلى الله ثم إليكم بمبالاتكم ومبالات وليكم وبالبراءة من أعدائكم 
والناصبين لكم الحرب وبالبراءة من أشياعه وأتباعه إني سلم لمن سالمكم وحرب لمن حاربكم وولي لمن والاكم وعدو لمن عاداكم فأسأل الله الذي أكرمني بمعرفتكم ومعرفة أهليائكم ورزقني البراءة من أعدائكم أن يجعلني معكم في الدنيا والآخرة وأن يثبت لي عندكم قدم صدق في الدنيا والآخرة وأسأله أن يبلغني المقام المحمود لكم عند الله وأن يرزقني طلب ثاري مع إمام هدى ظاهر ناطق بالحق منكم وأسأل الله بحقكم وبالشأن الذي لكم عنده أن يعطيني بمصابي بكم أفضل ما يعطي مصابا بمصيبته مصيبة ما أعظمها وأعظم رزيتها في الإسلام وفي جميع السماوات والآن اللهم اجعلني في مقامي هذا ممن تناله منك صلوات ورحمة ومغفرة اللهم اجعل محيا محيا محمد وآل محمد ومماتي ممات محمد وآل محمد اللهم إن هذا يوم تبركت به بنو أمية وابن آكلة الأكباد اللعين ابن اللعين على لسانك ولسان نبيك صلى الله عليه وآله في كل موطن وموقف وغف فيه نبيك صلى الله عليه وآله اللهم العن أبا سفيان ومعامية ويزيد ابن معامية عليهم من اللعنة أبد الآبدين وهذا يوم فرحت به آل زياد وآل مروان بقتلهم الحسين صلوات الله عليه اللهم فضاعف عليهم اللعن منك والعذاب اللهم إني أتقرب إليك في هذا اليوم وف... أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي أنزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور عرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأسمين المظلومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله سبحانه وتعالى إنه لقرآن says the following to us ووصينا الإنسان بوالديه حملت أمه وهنا على وهن وفصاله في عامين ينشك لي ولوالدي إلي المصير صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوة الله محمد وأهل محمد All praise belongs to Allah and we thank him for granting us parents as you know parents are the closest means for you and I to recognize the mercy of Allah no one is closer to us in a practical way than our parents 
For Allah is the one who created us, He's the one who shaped us, He's the one who continues to feed us, He's the one who continues to sustain us. He is the one who's given us shape, form, and beauty. Indeed, we created mankind in the best of forms. You and I are magnificent as a creation. Biped, supine individuals, intelligent, capable of speaking intelligently, and to be able to utilize all the resources in the universe for our benefits. This is a unique gift. And Allah being the beneficent, the merciful, his way of expressing that beneficence is through our parents. It is our parents who become our ardent protectors. And that is why we note that when we have to deal with orphans, you'll find that no group of children on earth are more abused than orphans because their parents are not there to protect them. And as a result, they tend to get abused. Parents, when I deal with parents in school, you see it in their eyes. They have more passion for the well-being of their children than themselves. And mothers especially are willing to give their hearts and their souls for the well-being of their children, including the fathers. And it's very, very essential to understand that that feeling, that emotion is the greatest mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even in the animal kingdom, you will find among chickens, you see that the mother when you go near the chicks, the mother will come and snap at you, you know, and make sure that nobody touches her little ones. Because it's instinctually built within us that we need to be protected as children. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it very clear in the Quran. Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَنْ لَا تَعْبُدُ إِلَّا إِيَّا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Verse number 23, 17-23. إِمَّا يَبْلُغَنَّ عِنْدَكَ الْكِبَرَ أَوْ أَحَدُهُمَا أَوْ كِلَاهُمَا فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفْفِمْ وَلَا تَنْهَرْهُمَا وَقُلْ لَهُمَا قَوْلًا كَرِيمًا Allah continues, وَاغْفِضْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَ الظُّلِّ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ وَقُلْ رَبِّهِ Look how beautiful the verse is. Translation. Your Lord has commanded that you shall serve none other than Him. This is the ayah of Tawheed. Meaning Allah has commanded us that we must not do shirk. Only God is worthy of worship. We must not associate anyone with Allah. And I'll talk about it briefly tonight. The importance of maintaining the purity of Tawheed. Why is Tawheed so important? And then Allah says, and وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَنْ لَا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانِ And this is the only verse in the Quran where Tawheed, oneness of God, is connected with obedience to parents. And Allah says, and goodness to your parents. If either or both of them reach old age with you. And you know, when parents reach old age, we tend to become very irritated with them because they are demanding more time from us. And in our busy lives, we feel that they become a burden, forgetting that when we were children burdening them, they gave up everything for us. But we feel entitled as as children that yes our parents should only be serving us when in fact our obligation is to serve them Allah says when they reach old age don't even say uff uff is the shortest word in Arabic ah like ah don't say that and don't chide them and speak with them a generous word qawlan karima generous kind words very difficult I must say it's very difficult and Allah says, وَحْفِظْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَ الظُّلِّ Make yourself submissively gentle to them with compassion and read the following prayer. My Lord, have compassion on them. رَبِّ رَحَمْهُمَا كَمَا رَبَّيَانِ صَغِيرًا Have compassion on them as they brought me up when I was little. This is a universal verse in the Quran. And we need to understand that when we want to worship Allah, 
If we do not respect our parents, all our mention of Allah is nullified. Meaning to worship Allah, to go to the masjid and to pray and to be disrespectful or disobedient or neglectful towards our parents is tantamount to doing nothing. It's like a creature with no head. You know, when we pray to Allah, people ask me this question. You know, people who say we've stopped praying. Let me touch on this. Prayer. Prayer is gratitude. Many times we ask children, why do you pray? They said, if I don't pray, I'm going to go to hell. This is how we teach our children. Son, daughter, make sure you pray. If you don't pray, you will burn in hell. This child is trembling. Oh, I don't want to go to hell. So when you ask them, why do you pray? Oh, I don't want to go to hell. That fear is only for reckless, careless human beings. What we call people who are recalcitrants. You know, in English, the ones who challenge authority. The ones who don't care about right versus wrong. The reckless individual who is damaging society. That's the one you threaten with fear. That if you don't, this will happen. The way Imam Hussain was putting fear into the army of Yazid. For they were misbehaving. But among believers, we don't need to use such verses. Although fear is there, let's invite our children with love. So that when we go to pray, it's not because I'm avoiding hell. I go to pray because I'm grateful to Allah. I have gratitude. I am thankful. And the principles of thankfulness is universal. When Allah says, you know, that he has enjoined upon mankind, right? Mankind is a universal principle. Kindness to parents is a universal principle. It is indicative of true essence of faith. For if you and I claim to love Allah, you and I claim to love anyone. If we do not show respect and love for our parents, then all the love we give out is fake. It's false. Because it's misconnected. For the very root of love that taught us how to love came from Allah through the Prophet Ahl al -Bayt, and through our parents. And if we do not understand the very hands that raised us, and if we do not understand that, there is no way you and I will ever understand what is the mercy of Allah. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. We find that we have to Respect. So I ask children, kids come and ask me, say, brother, why do you pray? I said, you must thank Allah. There is not a breath you and I take. There is not a moment you and I live by. Upon which Allah, if he did not allow its enablement, I would not have been able to do it. It's impossible. Allah in the Quran says, not a leaf falls from the tree without his permission. It is he who manages the affairs of the universe. And it is due to his mercy you see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has it. So when we ask the question, why do we pray? It's gratitude. Although prayer, the outcome of prayer, when you and I indulge in gratitude, we become good people. And when we become good people, it means we avoid the haram. When we avoid the haram and the makru, it's just natural to be good. We have ahkam al-khamsa, wajib, haram, mustahab, makru, and mubah. Wajib and haram are the two most important. And of the two, haram is more important than wajib. From the perspective of keeping away from the filth. For when you keep away from haram, wajib becomes very easy. So when Allah says, Inna salata tanha anil fahshai wal munkar wala dhikrullahi akbar. Prayer keeps you away from wrongdoing and evil. What prayer does is while I'm grateful, I am no longer ungrateful. While I am grateful, I am no longer depressed. While I am grateful, I am no longer cursing. While I am grateful, I am no longer damning. While I am grateful, I am no longer complaining. Nor am I damaging myself. So when Allah says, Inna salata tanha anil fahshai wal munkar, salah keeps you away from wrongdoing and evil. What it does is it makes me a happy individual. When I talked about guided meditation, many people showed interest in that. Meditation, it's part of Islam. The Prophet used to meditate frequently. There are ways and means by which to meditate amazingly. But meditation with understanding, particularly through the Quran, 
Where when you meditate and you reflect on the Quran, you see, when you think of the verse and why the verse is constructed the way it is, it is an elixir, as we say. It touches the heart in a cathartic way and it takes the evilness away from us. It takes the pressure away from us. It takes the, uh, the depression. Allah ta'ala, what we have revealed, is an elixir. Reflect, meditate. So when you're thinking and being grateful that when you're sitting, standing and lying on your side and thinking why the universe exists, look around and see the beauty of the human race and be grateful that somebody is looking at you. Be grateful there's somebody around you. Be grateful that there's somebody who's breathing next to you. Be grateful there's a society. You know how gregarious and social we are? We become very depressed when we're alone. Solitary confinement in prison is one of the worst punishments because you have no social environment. You don't have anybody to interact with. We humans are highly social. Do we appreciate that? Do we sit around and say, thank God there are humans. Thank God there are a variety of humans. Gratitude. So I asked children, I said, when somebody comes on your door and knocks on your door and you open it and they have a beautiful gift with no strings attached, Something you really wanted, something you were thinking about that you couldn't have, but somebody brought it to you. I ask all human beings this question, not Muslims, all human beings. And you open up this gift. And by the way, do you know there's a surprise factor of gifts? It's a very interesting conversation about the unknown. We are afraid of death, we're afraid of tomorrow, but we love not knowing what's in the gift. We're funny creatures, aren't we? We love it when we don't know the, the, the surprise factor of a birthday gift is so exciting. Why aren't we having the same excitement about tomorrow and the Day of Judgment? Because hmm? we don't believe in it. <laughs> it's amazing when you have a gift. Oh, I, I, I don't know what it is. Are you surprised? Oh, I'm excited. You don't know what it is. I know, but I'm excited. Okay, you don't know tomorrow. You should be excited. <laughs> You don't know the day of judgment, be excited. No, 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 that's a f I'm afraid of that day. I'm running away. See, there's a difference. But when a gift comes to us and we don't know what it is, we love it. Then you open it up, you say, oh my God, this is exactly what I wanted. Now what's protocol? Ask anybody me who's got any sense in their head, what's protocol? Thank you. And what's protocol about thank you? How quickly should you say thank you? Imagine somebody brings a gift to you and you open it up, mm. Oh, very nice, very nice. You take it away, you take the box, you shut the door on the person. And then 24 hours, oh, by the way, that gift, oh, it was awesome, thank you. You know, every, 30, every second you wait in thanking for the gift, you're belittling the act of the gift. Did you notice that? <laughs> Somebody gives you a gift, said, hmm, nice. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Oh, you didn't like the gift. Why? I loved it. No, it, it, it took you a few seconds to say thank you. Imagine salah. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laid times by which you and I should be grateful and grateful for what he has given us, we want to delay it. Is it important? Wait, another 10 minutes, another hour. So basically we're saying to Allah, your gift of life, your gift of air, your gift of breath, your gift of health, wealth, everything, children, family, you know what? It's okay. It can wait. When we tell our children this, they say, oh, you're so right. Now, when does prayer become, when does it become very pleasurable? When you and I account for the gifts given to us. Because when somebody sends you a gift you never imagined possible, you keep sending the message, oh, by the way, I just can't stop thanking you. Oh my God, that gift was amazing. Two days later, just by the way, thank you so much for that. I really... The guy says, thank you, you've told me thank you. No, no, it was an amazing gift. I cannot stop thanking you. Would you say this person is crazy? No. Allah in Surah Ibrahim says, وَإِذْ تَأَذَّنَ رَبُّكُمْ لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ وَلَإِن كَفَرْتُمْ إِنَّ عَذَابِ لَشَدِيمٌ We've made a calling on you, O oh people, that if you are grateful, we will give you more. You, f you find psychologists have studied human behavior in stating that when human beings are grateful, they have less tension, less depression, 
they're more vibrant, they live longer, they're happier, they look deeper into their lives. These are all processes of meditation, reflection, appreciation, by which when I look around and say, thank you, Alhamdulillah, when you drive your car, say Bismillah when you get in the car. When you reach your point, say Alhamdulillah, I arrive safe. And the agnostic and the atheist says, no, 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 that was all just chance. No, it wasn't chance. There was divine intervention in my driving. For how do I know that when I got delayed in that traffic, it wasn't because Allah was averting me from a greater tragedy? How do you know? The atheist says, oh, that's just all probability. Probability doesn't work except in structure and order. Please understand that. Pure randomness does not exist in the universe. There is no such thing. It's a, concoct, a concocted idea. There is no such thing as pure randomness. It's nonsense. Randomness exists within structure, within a frame that allows random things to move. The structure is essential for randomness to work. Please, anybody who knows mathematics will tell you this, it's absurd to have pure probability. Even Roger Penrose, who's a world-class mathematician, says the probability of anything happening in pure probability is zero. It doesn't exist. So the idea that you and I existed out of pure chance is nothing short of insanity. So when we drive, and when we pray, and when we do things, and when things do come our way, we should be grateful, not to say, oh, it was expected. You know, that's how nature works anyway. But the irony of the human being is that when something goes wrong, suddenly God becomes very prevalent. When the tsunami took place in Indonesia, and I had friends of mine telling me, where was God to stop that? Hmm? A loving God? I said, before the tsunami, it was sunny, and you guys were sipping your nice juices. Did you say, where was God then? Then there was no God. Allah says, وَإِذَا غَشَّوْ مَوْجٌ كَالْظُلَلِ دَعْوُ اللَّهَ مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ فَلَمَّا نَجَّاهُ مِلَ الْبَرِّ فَمِنْهُمْ مُقْفَصِدْ when the waves cover them and they're about to drown, they turn to God, Mukhlisin Allahuddin, sincerely saying, Oh God, oh my God, please. Before there was no God. Like, what God? There is no God. It's all probability, it's all chance. Everything's happening out of chance. Oh yeah? And then when you're about to fall or your plane is about to crash, oh my God, oh my God. Even the atheist says, Oh my God. I say, Excuse me, there is no God. Salawat. You find that oh, they turn to God. And Allah says, when I send them back to shore, ah, it was just chance. It was that wave, you know, it took me. It was just pure chance. Allah says, said, Really? You think that was a God? God took me there? I don't know. You think so? Maybe not. Shaitan puts his whispering in our ears. He said, no, you don't believe in that, do you? How do you know God did that? This is the difference in Iman. And Iman, not in blind faith, rational, logical. Negate this. It's absurd. The idea of a non-being where this universe is functioning autonomously without direction is absolutely insane. It's impossible. Mathematically, psychologically, physiologically impossible. And I'm saying this without any hesitation. So please, don't let it even feed into our minds. Because I'm telling you, from a rational perspective, logical, philosophical perspective, the very notion of proposing such ideas is totally false. It's built on false assumptions which leads people to false ideologies. So Allah is saying, when you come to pray, Understand that even the takbir you just did, if I didn't allow you to do this, you know, this I'm doing right now, I have no idea how I'm doing this. Just, you know it, I know it. You know, I just move my hands here. Even when I'm speaking, I'm speaking, right? I said there was a very tall mountain, you know, right? I don't know how I'm doing this. Allah says, Allahul Bayan. We taught you how to do this, Allah said. When children start to babble their first syllable, you know, it says they start making ba ba ga ga. You what? You went and turned the switch on in a child. Parents are recording. Please, amazing first words from the baby. 
Allah says, I programmed this child. Are you excited? Oh, my baby's talking. Isn't it beautiful? Allah says, I did that. Are you grateful? You think this is chance? You think this is probability? Try it. The probability of such things to happen? Are you kidding me? If you study molecular science, if you have an iota of a mistake in the way the DNA replicates itself, an iota, it goes wacko and it aborts. This is, we get disappointed. Allah says millions and millions of you are born in the billions of societies. Who do you think manufactures this? And look at every one of you that not a single one of you, even though your DNA is identical, not a single one of yours, fingerprints are the same. Allah says banana, all the way to your fingertips, we have perfected you. Are we grateful for that? Little you are grateful. Why? Because we say, ah, it's chance, it's this. Wrong. When you and I do that, our body starts to become a complainer. He's seeing the glass is half empty. And the minute we live a life of half emptiness, and this is common sense. When human beings look at a glass that has water filled half, you can see it as half full or half empty. The choice is yours. Allah says, if you see it as half empty, your mind will create attitudes that's all half empty. You will complain, you will find reasons, you will become reckless, you will become rude, you will become harsh, and you will become disappointed, and you will become unhappy and you will indulge in drugs, and you may even kill yourself. Why? Because that's the only way God has created. Allah is so merciful that he said you have two options. Either you spiral into the eternal abyss of negative through negations, or you rise up to the occasion and you accept its true reality and rise up to its true realities. Our obligation, brothers and sisters, as I mentioned the other day, is Allah created us for paradise. Allah did not create us for hell. While hell awaits us if we want it, it is not where we are destined to be. The question is not that. The question you might be thinking, oh, well, if I've been created for paradise, then it's fine no matter what I do. No, there are levels of paradise. There are low levels of paradise and there are very high stations in paradise. Allah in the Quran talks about high stations called maqam e mahmood Allah says, if you do salatul layl, Maybe we will grant you maqam mahmood a great position in paradise, where sabiqoon as sabiqoon shall enter it, the foremost of the foremost. Now you and I should be thinking, fantasizing, and appreciating God for all that he has given us in salah, going happily, ever ready to say thank you, thank you. How many times can I say thank you to my Lord? I'd like to raise my hand a thousand times. I want to thank you because everything around me is so beautiful. I want to thank you. If you and I posit that thought, then you and I will want to do good. You and I will avoid evil. You and I will say, no, I don't want to be impure. You and I will look at all the values of life and you and I will practice patience, forbearance, love, compassion, giving, forgiving, caring, sharing, because it'll become natural. Because the natural body propensity is that the minute you and I see positive things and we're happy on that day, we find it very difficult to complain. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. You know, if you ever got very good news, let's say today you just won $100 million and the bags of money just came and it's sitting in your room and you're counting it. But it's just material, you know? And somebody says, hey, there's somebody talking bad about you. You say, oh yeah, no problem. <laughs> Leave me alone, I'm busy. Oh, somebody's backbiting you. I don't care, I'm so happy right now. This thing that I've been waiting for, right? Just imagine, something you wanted, you have it. You notice that the minute you're grateful about it and you're basking in its glory, you find that having negative thoughts becomes very difficult. When you and I look around and see the grace and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will find our tensions will go down, our angers will go down, our gratitudes will increase. And if you and I can predict, knowing that every one of us is going to die, and if we can see each other potentially dead tomorrow, then you and I will never be harsh with each other. Allah says, Inna Allah indahu ilmu sa'a wa yunazzilu al-ghayf wa ya'lamu ma fi al-arham wa ma tadri nafsun ma da taksibu ghada wa ma tadri nafsun bi ayyi ardin tamut. 
This in Surah Luqman, the last verse, Allah says, Indeed, the knowledge of time is with Allah. In Allah in the ilmu al-ghayth. He is the one who brings rain down. He knows what lies in the wombs of the mothers, their future, their destiny, entirely, everything. No self knows what they will earn tomorrow. What will you send tomorrow? No one knows. Yes, Allah says, Ya Amanu, you say, Taqullah wal tanzur nafsun ma qaddamat lighad. Or you believe, be God conscious and be aware, acutely aware of what you send tomorrow. But Allah says, no one knows the outcome of tomorrow. Well, at, you know, nobody knows, right? And no self knows on which land they will die. وَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ بِأَيِّ أَرْضٍ تَمُوتٌ You and I may plan that my grave is here and we may die somewhere else. Today we have the luxury of shipping bodies to other parts of the world. But in the olden days, forget it. You die, you're buried right there. You're not taken anywhere. Allah says, the whole earth is your platform. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, be grateful. For if you examine what I have given you, and what I am sending for you for tomorrow. Plan it, think about it, stand up to it. And when you evaluate it, our lives become much happier. So when we are grateful and we indulge in gratitude and we refuse to complain, neuroscientists have studied that when we complain, we actually create neural pathways with glial cells in our brains that becomes a pathway of pleasure to complain. There are people who've become persistent complainers because they've developed so much complaining. We need to eradicate this complaining and say, no, from now onwards, I'm always going to see the glass as half full. You know, there's a joke of a man who used to, you know, an, uh, an atheist would put food on the man's door, you know, and the man would look at the food, he would take it, he said, oh, thank God, thank God. Second time he puts food, thank God, thank God. Third time, he said, thank God. He says, ha, you thought it was God. It was me. <laughs> the man looks and says, thank God there's an atheist like you to feed me. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. You can't beat it. Always look at the bright side. Always. Allah says, Asa an takrahu shay'an wa wa khayrun lakum. Wa asa an tuhibbu shay'an wa wa sharrun lakum. That which you don't like and it happens could be good for you. And that which you like could be bad for you. Why don't you turn it to Allah and say, my Lord, you make it right. I will talk about this tomorrow, inshallah, if time permits. The Ashab al-Kaf, the companions of the cave. Allah says, Am hasibta anna ashab al-Kahfi wal-Raqeem kanu min ayatina ajaba idh awal fityatu إِلَى الْكَهْفِ فَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا آتِنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَةً وَهَيِّئْ لَنَا مِنْ أَمْرِنَا رَشَدًا Listen to this dua, brilliant, priceless. How often we've ignored it. We haven't even looked at it. The sentence structure is magnificent. The story is magnificent in Surah Al-Kahf. Allah says, have you not considered? أَمْ حَسِبْتَ the companions of the cave and their inscription. This was an incre incredible miracle. Ayatina ajaba. Ajeeb. Amazing. What happened? He says, when those youth were in the cave, he says, they prayed, Our Lord, give us from your treasury. Min ladunka rahma. Give it. Because they are positive. They are not complainers. They are full of gratitude. They are full of grace. Atina. Two prayers. Two. I'll talk about it, inshallah. How to pray. Tomorrow when Imam Hussain alayhi salam is going towards Yazid. If you listen to his dua. My God. I wish there was time to talk about it. Where his prayer is nothing but Allah. He's talking to Allah. You. Ridham bi qada. Wa tasliman li amri. I trust you. Well, I have trust in you. Qul huwa rahman wa amanna bihi. Wa alayhi tawakkalna. Imam Hussain is reading dua. My God, he's teaching me 14 centuries later, Hassanain, you have a problem? 
You cannot, your problem can't equal mine. In a thousand years, it can't equal my problem. And look how I am praying. Look how grateful I am. Look how much I am in pleasure of God. Imam Hussein says, these are the youth of the cave. Allah says, do you know what I did for them? They prayed to me. Ad'uni astajib lakum. Don't doubt this, please. I have lived in my life where I've been cornered, put on the edge, even my life threatened, and you are trembling, and there's nothing that comes in my mind. Then Amir al-Mu'minin, the Holy Prophet, Amir al-Mu'minin, Imam Hussein alayhi salam, and he's saying, hold on, Allah is testing you, wait. And around the corner, the most amazing things happen. So amazing, impossible to achieve, impossible. But Allah says, if you are patient and you wait and you trust me, you will be amazed what you will conquer in this world. There is a story to be told about Yusuf It's so much. These are all universities of conversations, which I can't go deep into their conversations tonight or some other nights, but we'll try to get a touch, get a feel of this incredible ocean of mercy of God, that you and I should have no excuse to be depressed. You and I should have no excuse to be angry. We all get angry. Believe me, the days I get angry in my foolishness, immediately I realize, oh, I forgot you, Allah. That's why I got angry. For if I remember you, I just can't get angry. But the day I forget you, I easily get angry. I get irritated, I, I you know, burst into anger, and then I stop and I say, how foolish of me, how foolish of me, I forgot you Allah. Allah says, Allah bi dhikrillah tatma'inna al -qulu. When you remember me, you will be calm, you understand, I am your source of gratitude, I am your source of mercy, hold on to me. That even if the world is stabbing you, even if the world is throwing arrows at you, you will hold it with dignity and valor, the way the people of Karbala did it. When they used to charge in front of the enemies, and they used to recite poetry with, with pride and say, we are here, sons of Fulan bin Fulan, and this is how we fight. The enemy was stunned. Why? Because they were grateful, full of gratitude, deep in thought. So when you and I understand this, to the companions of the cave, they prayed to Allah. They were youth to be killed by Trajan, who was, uh, what we call uh, an emperor of Rome, Byzantium emperor, and he said, if you don't worship me as your God, I'll kill you. They said, kill us. We say, la ilaha illallah, Isa Rasulillah. Our shahadatain of Islam is there is no God but Allah, and Isa is the messenger of God. He said, I will kill you. They said, kill us. He said, I'll crucify you. Do it. But they prayed to God. Oh, our Lord, you give us from your infinite treasury. And make our affairs right. We don't know. We think we're smart. We think maybe that pathway is right. Maybe that pathway is right. Maybe this pathway is right. I don't know. I say, Allah, guide me. Take me where you think is good. See? Leave it to Allah. Tawakkal. So Allah says, look what I did for them. I took them into a cave and put them to sleep for 300 solar years, 309 lunar years. Amazing, isn't it? They were wondering how this tyrant who was so powerful, who was so powerful that you could not escape his clutches, how is he going to die and turn to dust? Allah said, watch, I'll show it to you. For time is a minuscule moment. By time, man is at a loss. And time moves so quickly. Quran addresses it beautifully. No time to discuss it, but understand it for now. And 300 years later, they wake up. They think they slept for one day. They go down to collect food. Halal, tayyiban, rizqan, tayyiban. They are going to eat pure food. They find that their coins are outdated three centuries. That's how many? That's six generations forward. Wow. And now the leader is coming. He's younger than his great, 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 great grandfather. Amazing. How did you do this? Allah says, they prayed for me. They prayed for me to give them something. They asked me. They were grateful. They were willing to stand up against tyranny. They did not sell their souls to the devil. Look what I did for them. You think I won't do this for you? If you ask the companions of the cave before they were about to be crucified, what is your wish? Never under the sky would they have prayed to go to sleep for 300 years. Never under the sky would it even cross their minds 
to be able to ask for that. But Allah says, when you ask from me, my treasury is infinite and I will give you things unimaginable that when you achieve them, the world will be wondering, how did you get it? Allah said, just ask me. Then answer me, Allah says. You believe in me? Do you trust me? Or do you have half-heartedness? Belief here is subservience to our parents. When I've seen atheists who are honest and loving to their parents, and I've seen believers who are rough and crude to their parents, I said that atheist is better than this one. So, but this one believes in Allah. What believe in Allah if he doesn't practice it? That the very hand that raised this child is the one who I was condemning this parent? This is not ibadah. This is not iman. For that one who doesn't believe in God maybe has not understood God. But at least his actions are conducive to the command of Allah in the Quran. But you find ourselves many a times. I ask us all at home, go hug our parents. Look at them. My parents are here. I look at them. Every once in a while, I'll observe them. I'll look at their hair. I'll look at their skin. I'll look at my father's hair. And then I will sit and I'll memorize that hair. Because there will come a day when that piece of hair will be priceless. Where we're going to hold it in our pocket. That is my father's hair. But why when he was alive, you didn't hug him? Why was he when he was alive, you didn't? Why you're not nice to him? You know, I've seen some people say, this is my aunt's spectacles when she died. And there's a small piece of, oh, don't touch it. It's precious. I said, how precious is that hair? Oh, it's the, the hair of that person I love. That's my way of loving the person. I touch the hair. So why when they were alive, you didn't hug them? You think, no, no, they're going to go. When we shake hands with each other, when we hug each other, how do you and I know that we will be alive tonight? When we say salam to each other, I've had situations where I've said salam to people, and then I hear, by the way, that brother who said salam to you, he just died today. Really? I just met it this morning. Yeah, he's gone. What, are you going to go to the grave and cry for them? You're going to say, forgive me? And then when we go to the grave, we put on a somber face. Oh, we do five takbir, you know, in Salatul Mayyit. So all lie bear witnesses was a good person. Were you? Were we? Or did we backbite? Did we fault find? Did we find reasons to belittle them? Why can't we be nice to them before they leave? Allah says, you don't know in which land you're going to die. Why don't you be grateful? Why don't you love humanity? Why don't you forgive? Why wait for them to die and then you ask for forgiveness? Why not ask for it now? Allah says, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَىٰ مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُ وَالسَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ وَعِدَّةٍ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ سَارِعُوا in Arabic means hasten, run, don't walk, run. مَغْفِرَةٌ You know what istighfar is? مَغْفِرَةٌ غَفَرَةٌ has many meanings, two main meanings. One, ask for forgiveness. Second meaning, ask for protection. When prophets ask for istighfar in the Quran, in their hearts, they're asking for forgiveness. But their real prayer is asking Allah to protect them. For they make no mistakes, but they still think they are mistaken because they are so humble in front of Allah that though they are perfect in their actions, they are still asking for Allah's forgiveness. Just like we say, Afwan, Bivakshi, Pardon me, forgive me, excuse me. I'm going to ask you a question, forgive me. You say, well, forgive you for what? You haven't made a mistake. No, no, what I mean is, if I do, don't punish me. Or protect me from that mistake. Oh, I see. This is Quran. Istighfar in the Quran is that. And the Holy Prophet was asked, what is this life? He says, the distance between two sujoods. Two sujoods. He says, what do you mean? You know, yesterday I mentioned, مِنْهَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ وَفِيهَا نُعِيدُكُمْ وَمِنْهَا نُخْرِجُكُمْ تَارَةً أُخْرَى From it you were created, to it you will return, and from it you will be raised. The Prophet said the distance between the first sujood and second sujood is this life. So you were born from the earth, you live on earth, and you go into sujood, and you die. And on judgment day, Allah will raise you. So every time you and I pray, while we are grateful and full of gratitude, and you're thinking, I have this body, I have the wealth, I have the health. Don't think of negatives. And by the way, when Allah says, take something away from you, something you love, say it's a gratefulness. Thank you, my Lord, for testing me with that. For there is no value but you. And if you're going to take everything away from me, 
You just don't take away yourself. I'm kaifa askunun fin nari wa raja. Imam Ali alayhi salam said, I can bear the heat of hell, but I cannot bear the separation from you, O oh Allah. Imam Ali alayhi salam says, If you were to cast me in hell, Imam says, I will bear it, but my separation from you I cannot bear. Now, when you and I go and pray with that kind of gratitude, the body just resonates positively. You go into ruku, you go into sujood, and you're enjoying it. It's full of meaning. So it's imperative for us that while we are grateful and you're thinking that I have parents, I have a society. If you have children, I have children, I have a spouse, I have all of this. And you're doing Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar Rahman, and you're praying and you're looking towards the Kaaba. And you're saying, thank you, my Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I can't thank you enough. Now, when you get into sujood, sujood is the ultimate. You know, ruku is permission to go to sujood. When you get into sujood, subhana rabbi ala, when you have lowered your head, it is the ultimate position of gratitude. And you know what's amazing about salah? Muslims, when we pray, you don't have to tell anybody you're praying. Because every act in prayer is universally understood, it's a prayer. When you do kunut, when you do ruku, when you do sujood, even a non-believer will know you are praying. For that's the beauty of the action of a believer, that when we pray. But you know what's beautiful is when others watch us being grateful, we are also inspiring them to be grateful. On an airline one time on British Airways, we were on the upper deck and we asked to pray. So they said, sure, three flight attendants. They laid the carpet, I mean, you know, the cloth for us in the back. And they said, go and pray. I said, Alhamdulillah. I asked my mother. She said, if this plane is flying, who do you think is causing it to fly? You, the pilot? No, it's Allah. It's prayer time, time to pray. And you know the most beautiful part of that prayer was my parents came out, I was next, and as I'm walking, these three flight attendants are sitting there, non-Muslims, I just looked at them, I said, I thank you for giving me this opportunity. They said, no, no, sir, the honor is ours. Please, you pray for us too. You know how beautiful that is? Even my roommate, who when I went to the university, saw me praying the first time, he observed me, and then he was so impressed with it for the rest of his life until today, he has not stopped speaking. That that day, I saw you praying. And in the university, you always used to pray. I honored you so much, I call you my teacher. I said, really? I just prayed. He said, you have no idea how good I feel when you pray. I told him, I think you'll feel better if you pray, but that's a secondary matter. <laughs> Salawat. <laughs> Our parents, let me read some hadith. The Prophet has stated some amazing hadith. The Holy Prophet said, Read Allah, Firid al Walidain. Wasakatu fi sakatihima. Think about it, how important it is. The Prophet said, The pleasure of Allah lies in the pleasure of your parents, if one's parents. If your parents are happy with you, then Allah is happy with you. Think about it. You want Allah's pleasure? Get your parents' pleasure. Very important. Read Allah. Allah says, and the wrath, the wrath, in other words, the wrath of Allah lies in the wrath. Uh, his wrath lies in their wrath. Meaning when parents are angry, Allah is disappointed. So parents' happiness is con connected with our happiness. Think about that, very important. Another Imam Jaffa Sadiq says, the best deeds are the following. He says, Afdalul A'mal, as salatu lil waqtiha, wa birral walidain. Think about it. He says, the best deeds are punctual prayer, kindness to parents, and contributing to the path of Allah, meaning spending to promote the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Three things, very important. Punctual prayer, kindness to, par to parents. You find that this value is exemplified in the Quran in all directions. Another hadith I will say, Imam Jaffa Sadiq says, he who wishes Allah, the glorious, to lighten the agonies of death, sakaratul maut, when you and I get into that pang of death, when death is imminent upon us, and if we are now having difficulty leaving this world, Imam, Imam Sadiq salam says, he says, he should have regard for his kinship, and treat his parents with goodness. 
Then, when a person does so, Allah will make the agonies of death easy for him or her, and he will not be stricken by poverty in life at all. This is how important it is. Today we live in a world where our children abuse parents. Parents abuse children. Why? We have disregard for each other. Sibling rivalry. Brothers and sisters fight. Brothers and brothers fight. You know why we fight? It's sad, but it's true. We fight because you can't get rid of them. How do you get rid of your parents? They're always your parents. No matter what you do, your parents are always your parents. Shaitan whispers into you, yeah. Even if you abuse them, they still love you. So kick them. Curse them. Smack them. Get angry. Don't obey them. They will still love you anyway. Shaitan is whispering. Brothers too. I see some brothers battered. I said, who's battering you? Oh, my bigger brother. Stop. This is your brother. I've seen brothers punch their brothers. Said, I'm just teaching them how to be tough. I said, how come you're so gentle with your friends? You know, when your friends come, yeah, oh, sorry, how are you? It's my friend. This is a friend who will leave you tonight. Yeah, but it's my friend, very precious. But that's your mother. Yeah, but she's always here. My brother's always here. I can't get rid of my sister. Some people say, I hate my sister. I said, don't say that. Oh, I hate my sister. She's always asking for... Stop. I said, if your sister gets ill and one hair in her body is hurt, what do you think you will do? Will you go visit her in the, air, at the hospital? Oh, yes. I said, then stop speaking this way and start nurturing this way and start loving this way for the gift God has given you, which he cannot take away from you due to his mercy, is the one you should respect the most, not the other way around. But we do that where our friends become precious. We cheat, we lie to our parents just to keep our friends happy. When our friends, if you ask me when I grew up, some of my friends were the most important people to me in my life. As a teenager, sometimes I would not speak the truth to my parents just to keep my friends happy. You know what's the irony also? Sometimes friends will insult their parents in front of them just to let them know, look how cool I am. You know, I had a boy who was training in tennis. He was training me in martial arts, and he, I was training him in tennis. One time I went to his house, and he was rude to his father. Not a Muslim. And he was very harsh to his dad. His father is a gentleman, and he's calling him. He says, ah, I don't have time for you right now. Don't bother me. I was very disturbed. Now, it made me realize, oh my God, I shouldn't be like this to my parents either. As a teenager, we were teenagers. But it dawned on me, something about it just bothered me. So we came out of a tennis game, and we were in the diner having a drink, you know, shakes. And I said, Clifford, if I ask you, if I tell you that your father just died, how would you feel? He stopped drinking, he looked at me, he said, you're joking, right? I said, what if I was not joking? How would you feel? Please tell me. He said, I'd feel horrible. I said, when you were home, you were so rude to him, like as if you wish he was dead. So why are you saying this now? He said, that's impossible. That thought cannot cross my mind. I said, no, I want you to think of that. I want you to think of that, that maybe your father won't be alive tonight. What will you do? You'll go to his grave now and ask him for forgiveness? He looked at me. I said, no, your father is not dead. That's all I said. We left. Two days later, the father calls me, frantic on the phone. He says, what have you done to my son? I said, what do you mean? He says, I can't get this son out of my face. He's standing by my door. He says, dad, can I do something for you? Can I take the trash can for you? I love you, dad. He keeps hugging me. This is not my son. I said, this is my religion. He says, you must have done something. I said, my religion taught me this. My prophet taught me this. My Quran taught me this. Love for parents. That boy until today is married, has children. His father always says, my son respects me so much. That one moment of thought, of accountability, that this death which is pending upon us, which Allah can take this mercy away from us any second. If you and I are neglectful of it and we do not care for it, then maybe we will become losers forever. This is exactly how shaitan wants us to think. To say, it's okay, abuse them. It's okay, we can use them again because they'll come back to us. You have no idea. There's a really sad story of a mother in Michigan who said to her son, I love you too much. The son would disobey the mother. The mother said, you're my only son. My husband is dead. You're my only son. He's a teenager boy. His friends were so important to him. 
And he went out, jumped off the window, and went with his friends to the club. Mother saying, don't go. Recklessness. This is a society today. If you look at the movies that are designed in Hollywood today, they're designed this way. They don't teach us morals. They don't teach us values on how to love our parents. If you watch majority of the movies, they're not designed to teach us high morals in the world today. We're just all a liability where we are rude and harsh and crude only to appear cool in front of people. The police knocks at the door at four hours later and says, is this your son? She said, my son is upstairs sleeping. I said, no ma'am. Is this your son? She said, yes. He says, we are sorry to let you know your son is dead. He got into a car accident and got killed that night. Now tell me how his friends, some of them survived. And they are crying today, regretting. How long will you regret? Shaitan says, I got you. How long will you regret? Why not preempt before you regret? Why not take the right action before it hits you hard? Isn't that the beauty of life? That catch it early. For Islam, the beauty of Islam is prevention is better than cure. Better than cure. These nights of Karbala, when we read, when we wonder, why the children, why the adults, why Imam Hussein, why his family were there, why were they not indulging in the worldly pleasures, why were they willing to give it all up? My God, it's that sacrifice that has brought us to this level of modesty and decency and deen. For if Imam Hussein did not go to Karbala, you and I would have had a carcass of religion. That is why the Prophet said, Husseinu minni wa ana min al Hussein. Hussein is from me and I am from Hussein. Why I? The Prophet said, he will save the deen I brought. He will save the deen that I perfected. For if not for his blood, my religion would have been tattered like the other religions. He has kept it intact and you will continue to make it grow that it will become the most powerful force in the world today and you will see the justice on earth which is around the corner and the tyrants will be crushed soon. It is through the blood of Imam Hussain alayhi salatu wasalam. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. In conclusion, my brothers, you and I, when we are gratified, we are full of gratitude and we are grateful and we look at our parents, we honor them. When our parents look at their children, say, this is my baraka, this is my child, and we hold them with compassion and love. And we know that this child and this, these parents and this society is within our jurisdiction of cause and effect. Then you and I will become strong. But no, brothers and sisters, no matter what you and I say, every one of us belongs to Allah. Lahu mulku samawati wal ard. Everything in the sky, in the universe belongs to Him. Our children, our parents, ourselves, everything belongs to Allah. And Allah wants to test us. Do you believe in me? Maybe I'll take it away from you. That loved one, maybe I will take it away. If you ever want to have firm faith, Hold on to Allah and move forward. Now you will see you will become a loving being and in gains and in losses, you will be neutral. You will not go crazy in losses, nor will you become extremely ecstatic in gains. You will know that every single day is the barakah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how our Imams were. Imam Hussain alayhi in Kufa, when he was going towards Kufa, the people of Kufa were unpredictable. Imam says, doesn't matter. Farazdak says their tongues are for you, but their swords are towards your neck. Imam says, doesn't matter. We are going towards our destiny. The world is upon us. Our obligation is to guide them. Whether they embrace us or they kill us, it doesn't matter. That level of certainty, the way Ashab al-Kahf were, historians say that Imam Hussain alayhi salam, before his head was cut, he was saying, Am hasibta anna ashab al kahfi wa raqib He was reading these verses. As you know, he was the Quran and natif walking, talking, talking Quran and he was reciting meaning meaning that I understand when you and I want Shahada to really understand the way Alil Akbar who was a teenager who loved Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who was the son of Imam Hussain alayhi his mother was Layla or Malayla you find that she was a prominent figure but you find that Shahada that love of Shahada doesn't come until you've evaluated everything around you you know the value of humans you know the value of wealth, you know the value of power, you know the value of everything. As the Imam is going towards Karbala, 
and Imam is in a swoon. Ali Akbar is next to him. Ali Akbar, as you know, was about 18 years of age, 19 years of age, young. And Imam says, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. So Ali Akbar says, Baba, what have you seen? He said, Am I, when I closed my eyes, I saw the Prophet. And the Prophet told me, you're coming to me soon. Your days are numbered. Be ready, O oh Hussein. Oh, my grandson, be ready. Your days are numbered. So Imam looks at Ali Akbar and says, my son, what do you think? What do you think of that? We're going towards our massacre. We're going to be butchered. A son looking at his father. Honestly, in history, if you and I were riding a horse knowing we were going to get butchered, all our love and desires of the world would distract us. You find a highly focused child who looks at his father and says, Baba, are we not in haq? Are we not in the truth? Do we not follow the truth? And the father said, yes, of course. Ali Akbar said, then Baba, let us proceed. For if that is our destiny, then let us go. Imam says, how blessed I am to have a son like you. You know, when Ali Akbar, on the day of Ashura, by the way, he was the first one among the Banu Hashim to go and become martyred. Ali Akbar was the first one. Imam Hussein's son was the first one to go. As you know, Imam Zain al-Abidin was present, but he was ill, and Imam did not allow him to lift a sword. Ali Akbar represented Imam Hussein salam, and the first one to go forward. Fajr time, Ashura. Amr ibn Sa'ad gets the letter from Ibn Ziyad, get the allegiance of Hussein, or give up, or give up this authority to Shimr. Ibn Sa'ad wanted to outdo everybody, so he takes the arrow and he screams. He said, observe, I, Umar, ben Abu, uh, Umar ibn Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas, I am the first one to send this arrow to start the war. For Imam Hussein salam, says, haram to start the war of jihad until the enemy hits you. Imam was so careful that Shimmer one time comes in the back of the tents while the Imam is digging a moat for he put fire in the back so they should not get attacked from the back because these people were treacherous. So Shimmer says to him, he says, oh, Hussein, so you are now preparing yourself to go to hell, taunting him. Muslim bin Awsaja was present. He became furious. He noticed this indecent attitude, this arrogant attitude cannot be tolerated. The rage of Muslim became uncontrollable. He put his hand on the hilt and he's ready to pull his sword out to strike Shimr. Imam looks at him, puts his hand on his hand and he says, don't, don't do that. Look at how perfect the Imam was. That while he's being insulted, he's telling Muslim bin Awsaja, don't pull the sword out. We are not here to start a war. We're here to present peace. We're here to bring harmony. We are Muslims. We are promoters of peace. We do not start wars. We end them. That's how perfect Imam was. So you find that Omar ibn Saad throws the arrow and the war starts at Fajr. Before Fajr, as you know, Imam Hussain alayhi salam wakes up and he says to Ali Akbar, Oh Ali Akbar, recite Adhan for Salatul Fajr. Now historians say that the voice, the face, the demeanor of Ali Akbar was carbon copied the Holy Prophet. Imam Hussain alayhi salam looks in the sky when Ali Akbar comes to him and says, my father, Give me permission to go and fight now. It's my time. He looks up, he says, my Lord, bear witness that when we want to think of the prophet and when we want to hear the prophet and when we want to hug the prophet, when we want to see the prophet, we look at this beautiful boy, Ali Akbar, for he is a carbon copy of the prophet. His look, his demeanor, even his voice. So Imam says to him, you recite Adam. And he recites Adhan. Can you imagine a father knowing that this son who's going to die very shortly, right before him, that level of strength is unprecedented in history. And you find Ali Akbar leads prayer, I mean, recites Adhan. Imam Hussain alayhi salam leads the prayers. The war starts. The battle starts. The companions have been killed. 
It's time for Ali Akbar. He goes to his aunt Zainab. Zainab hugs him. She hugs him, says, my nephew, you're going to leave. He said, I've come to ask for permission. She gives him permission. He goes to Imam Hussein. Imam looks up in the sky, he said, I complain, oh Allah, to these evil people, for they are taking the, the, the apple of my eye away from me. Imam takes his son, and he helps him climb up on the horse. You know, Ali Akbar, by the way, they say, was has as much shujaat as Abbas. He was an incredible warrior. He was trained by Abbas alayhi salam. Ali Akbar was trained, was a very good fighter. But the Imam helps him get on the horse. I want us to embed that image of a man who is sacrificing his most beloved, precious ornament on earth, his son. But his son was so kind to him, so loving, raised with such beauty the way Ismail was to Ibrahim. You know, Ibrahim could see his son was born when he was very old. And Allah said to him, look at this child. I'm going to ask you as a trial upon you to see if you can sacrifice. But even Ibrahim closed his eyes. Imam Hussein alayhi salam put his son up. And as the horse is moving slightly, Imam is following him. And as the horse goes forward, Imam is still following the horse. Ali Akbar pulls the reins and says, Baba, why are you following me? He said, if only you knew what it means to be a father. <laughs> if only you knew how it means to be a father, to look at you, my son, who's not going to come back alive. If only it was for me to see, if only you understood, oh Ali Akbar, you are not a father. I am your father. To let go of you is very difficult for me. Ali Akbar comes back. He says, Baba, you are thirsty. He says, I am thirsty. You are thirsty. Let me quench your tongue. Imam puts his tongue on Ali Akbar. It's too dry. There is nothing to give. Ali Akbar gets back on his horse and he goes to fight. And as he's fighting, there was a man by the name of Murra. Imam is watching this, and Murra takes a spear and lodges it into his chest, deep into his chest, and he cracks his ribs, and Ali Akbar falls. He says, Ya Abata, assalamu alaykum, Ya Abata. Please be upon you, my father. And he falls off his horse. Imam charges towards his son, puts his hand on his head, lifts him up, and he sees this spear and javelin deep lodged into his heart. Ali Akbar puts his hand on his chest. And Imam bids him goodbye. اللهم إنا نرغب إليك في دولة كريمة تعز بها الإسلام وأهله وتذل بها النفاق وأهله وتجعلنا فيها من الدعاة إلى طاعتك والقادة إلى سبيلك وترزقنا بها كرامة الدنيا والآخرة ربنا اغفر لنا ولإخواننا الذين سبقونا بالإيمان ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين آمنوا ربنا إنك Ra'ufur Rahim. Let's recite five times. Amma yujibul muttarra idha da'aw. Wa yakshifu su. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cure our ailments. To make Sayyid Hashim, inshallah, full health, long life. To keep our scholars, Shaykh Jafar, and all our scholars in our community, our maraji, that Allah gives them long life. They can continue to protect and guide the deen for us and for you and I. To be healthy, to be good role models for society, inshallah. To maximize our existence and to give us the energy to achieve the highest stations in paradise. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Amma yujimu mutarayna da'a wa yakshifu su. Amma yujimu mutarayna da'a wa yakshifu su. Amma yujimu mutarayna da'a wa yakshifu su.
تشرف الصوم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين Let's send salam to Imam Sa'ab al-Zaman and we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make him reappear soon so that this justice can prevail on earth بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كن لوليك حجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين صلاة الله محمد وعلى محمد I just want to make a quick announcement before you leave. I know we're we're reciting ziyara. There is volume thirty nine of Al Mizan, as you know, Allah ma taala taala Al Mizan fi Tafsir al Quran, which has been published. I highly encourage us all to read it. Inshallah, tomorrow I'll speak about this tafsir of Quran. Every one of us should have it in our libraries. It's a description of the principles of the Quran. It's a work of, it's a masterpiece work of art. And you and I should possess it, should read it, even a chapter, even a page, even the whole book if possible. But please, let's gain knowledge, let's acquire knowledge. And inshallah, I will also post, I will have the brothers post the book list. A lot of brothers and sisters have been asking me for the book list, the reading list. Inshallah, we will post that too. Bismillah. Please. Please. Go ahead. You need this? No, no, that's fine. Let's go. Thank you, Hush. Salla'ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. السلام عليك يا وارث نوح النبي الله السلام عليك يا وارث إبراهيم خليل الله السلام عليك يا وارث موسى كليم الله السلام عليك يا وارث عيسى روح الله السلام عليك يا وارث محمد حبيب الله السلام عليك يا وارث أمير المؤمنين عليه السلام السلام محمد المصطفى السلام عليك يا ابن علي المرتضى 
السلام عليك يا ابن فاطمة الزهراء السلام عليك يا ابن خديجة الكبرى السلام عليك يا ثار الله وابن ثاره والوتر الموتور أشهد أنك قد قمت الصلاة وآتيت الزكاة وأمرت بالمعروف ونهيت عن المنكر وأطاط الله ورسوله حتى أتاك اليقين فلعن الله أمة قتلت ولعن الله أمة ظلمت ولعن الله أمة سمعت بذلك فرديت به يا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله أشهد أنك كنت نورا في الأصلاب الشامخة والأرحام المطهرة لم تنجسك الجاهلية بأنجاسها ولم تلبسك من مدل همات ثيابها وأشهد أنك من دعائم الدين وأركان المؤمنين وأشهد أنك الإمام البر التقي الرضي الزكي الهادي المهدي وأشهد أن الأئمة من ولدك كلمة التقوى وأعلام الهدى والعروة الوثقى والحجة على أهل الدنيا وأشهد الله وملائكته وأنبياه ورسله إني بكم مؤمن وبي بكم موقن بشرايع ديني وخواتيم عملي وقلبي لقلبكم سلم وأمري لأمركم متبع صلوات الله عليكم وعلى أرواحكم وعلى أجسادكم وعلى أجسامكم وعلى شاهدكم وعلى غائبكم وعلى ظاهركم وعلى باطنكم بأبي أنت وأمي يا ابن رسول الله بأبي أنت وأمي يا أبا عبد الله لقد عظمت الرزية وجلت المصيبة بك علينا وعلى جميع أهل السماوات والأرض فلعن الله أمة أسرجت وألجمت وتهيأت لقتالك يا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله قصدت حرمك وأتيت إلى مشهدك أسأل الله بالشأن الذي لك عنده وبالمحل الذي لك لدي أن يصلي على محمد وآل محمد وأن يجعلني معكم في الدنيا والآخرة صلى على محمد وآل محمد